Welcome to S and M on Sci-Fi. This is M. And this is S. Well, first off, we're just going to come right out and invite Will Wheaton yes. to join us yes. anytime. Absolutely, um, open invitation. I, I, again, really not making a lot of effort. <laughs> I just kind of hoping someone finds it and shows it to him, and, you know, mm -hmm. and then he'll have like fifteen episodes he needs to catch up on. Yeah. One of these days. One of these days. It'd be kind of. We cool. we uh, mentioned Will in our previous uh, review of Elysium. Yes. And I mentioned that in that review that I had recently watched all the uh, Eureka episodes. Oh, yeah. But I didn't comment that I saw Will, of course. He's in yes, several episodes. Yes, he is. He's several kind of, of plays episodes. a jerk scientist in season four. I don't know about And he was five. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Which I think in one of our earlier reviews we said that we liked him in those kind of roles. Absolutely. Well, because he also kind of plays a similar type character in Leverage. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but they didn't they didn't utilize him very well. No, Did, was he in season five of Eureka? Uh, I think so. I, I think he. I know he was in season four. Yeah, because he's, he's he's towards the end. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. Anyway, it, great series by the way. But anyway, I've also moved on from the previous series that I mentioned that shall not be named because I am disappointed in it. <laughs> it uh, was bad. Anyway, I moved on. I'm starting to watch Farscape now, and I love it. It's yeah. so much fun. We've talked Farscape a little cool. bit about Farscape. Yep, exactly. So, so uh, just remind me, what do you like again about it? It's fun. It was, for the time, it was, to me, very original, very um, uh, visually fun to look at. Um, I understand. I mean, I, I get your point on some of the puppeteering was kind of... It was a weekly show, so how much production can you put into a weekly show? And this show, by its nature, requires a ton of it. So there's a few things where it flops and it fails, but I love John Crichton pulling out every single movie reference <laughs> that he could come up with during the show. It's, it's fun. I, I saw it you know, 15 years ago for the first time, and it's as fun now watching it as it was mm -hmm. then for me. So it's like going back to my childhood, so to speak. So if they were to, and I'll <coughs> say, uh, reboot, uh, <laughs> yeah, if they yeah. were to reboot Farscape, a whole new cast, right? or even better, a Farscape movie, right? what would you think? It really depends on who's going to do it. Um, if the Jim Henson production company that originally did it with the TV series uh, were to come out and do that, I would be on board. I think mm. it would be a lot of fun. Do a movie much the same way Joss Whedon did a movie of uh, Firefly, mm -hmm. called it Serenity. That's, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, if they did in that way instead of someone new, um, I'd, be, it, it, I'd be on board. If it's going to be someone new, for instance, a completely different person taking over the franchise, <coughs> J.J. Abrams, mm. um, <laughs> I don't think it would fly very well. I really don't. Um, I mean, nothing against J.J. Abrams. I just don't like what he's doing with Star Trek. But, oh, okay. Yeah, and, oh, and that brings me into Star Wars. Which interesting that you bring up Star Wars yeah. because tonight's review is on The Empire Strikes Back. Absolutely, my favorite movie of all time. And I believe you were there opening day, right? No, I was not. I'm uh, how old were you again? I um I was negative one years old when <laughs> the movie first aired, nineteen eighty. Um, this movie, and I am going to clarify it. Just because it's my favorite movie, doesn't make it the best movie. So my rating is going to be a little wonky. When you, you say think. the best, you in comparison to other Star Wars movies or um, other, other movies, movies in general, in general. Um, okay. you know, storyline, acting, sound production, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of movies out there that are probably better than uh, the Empire Strikes Back, but there are some things about Empire, especially when you take it in context with the other two Star Wars movies on either side of it, uh -huh. that just makes it fantastic. I know this movie forwards and backwards, front to sides. It's my favorite movie of all time, and obviously that goes without saying that my favorite Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, anyway, that's the movie I picked because it was my turn. So there. Well, and so I, I love the choice. It's a good one. So before we actually go watch the movie, I have a trivia question for you. Oh, good, because I have one for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go first. Oh, since darn. I, since okay. I'm uh, hosting today. Uh, we recently talked about the Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Right, right. So, rather than asking you a degree question, we're just going to go with uh, the first degree of Kevin Bacon. Sure. 2011, Kevin Bacon was one of the stars in the X-Men First Class, Class movie. Okay. List any three other actors that were cast in that movie. Okay. Oh, they have to be credited as. Are they credited? <laughs> oh. 
Any, any three. Your choice. Um, I can't name one, and because I don't, this actually goes into why I actually like that movie a lot. Mm -hmm. Is nearly every single actor in that movie was someone I don't know, and I like seeing unknown actors come in and do a big blockbuster like oh, this. Okay, cool. I love that because I don't have a preconception about whether or not I'm going to like or dislike this actor. I get to see a brand new performance. I don't no, remember a gonna, single one. <laughs> I'm gonna one. Oliver Platt, he plays, uh, the, he's one of the, the government guys, the one that recruits them, and he right. has his own little... Oh, wait, 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 right. He gets killed mo you know, halfway through. That's right, he was in... Um, he's in a lot of stuff. Oh, a lot of stuff. He was in um, 2012. Yeah, but, yeah, but he kind of plays these supporting roles. Right, exactly. Typically. By the way, 2012, bad movie. <laughs> we'll never... Yeah. We should review that just so I can yell to our audience about it. Don't ever watch this movie. Well, anyway. the uh, just to give you the uh, two others, the the two main characters, if you will, Charles Xavier and Eric Lyncher were James McAvoy, if you, that's how you say his last name, I'm not sure. Right. And uh, Michael Fos Fosbinder. Fosbinder sounds Fosbinder. convincing. Which, uh, by the way, that it's for Days of Future Past, which is coming out this year. You said yeah, June. I so uh huh. Um, I like that what they're doing is they're not rebooting it, actually. They're not trying to make a whole new franchise of X-Men with these new actors. They're going to bring in both, both sides. Mm -hmm. These young actors playing the young selves and their older actors playing the older selves. They're going to put them in the same movie together, and they're going to create Days of Future Past. So I have a lot of hopes, because that's honestly one of my favorite story arcs from X-Men. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's... I agree with you. I, I'm... I'm Really hoping this is well done. If, and if they don't show Cable for all that he is, I am going to be mad. I mean, uh, seriously. My my thing that I want to see, I want to see some Sentinels. So, oh yeah, and some good ones. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, no, um, I mean, well done when I say good. I don't. I don't care if we see Nimrod at all, but I do want to see Sentinels. I agree. I, I think we need to see that. You know what? N Nimrod, I think, is an interesting pick because. He Without knowing what Sentinels are, since, since this movie isn't even out yet, and we, right. I, have, I haven't looked at the blogs to see where it's headed, I like to be surprised in some yeah. movies. Yeah. Uh, Nimrod kind of needs a backstory, at least a knowledge of Sentinels. That's, a, that's, actually, that's actually a very good point. And by the way, those that are listening who don't know who Nimrod is, get your geek on, guys. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, anyway. So my trivia question. Your trivia question. Who did George Lucas originally want to play the voice of Darth Vader? Oh, boy. Um, I think I've actually heard this. I kind so. of figured one that... I, I picked one that I think you would have heard of, but didn't really hold on to. Original voice for Darth Vader. Yeah. Oh, my and it's a well-known name. Yeah. Um, I don't recall. Orson Welles. Oh boy! Yeah, yeah. That, 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 I think it's coming back to me, but I, I won't claim that I actually knew. Right. That one. Yeah, he wanted Orson Welles to do it originally, but he decided against it because he figured Orson Welles would have too recognizable of a voice. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking, James Earl Jones, we can identify in a microsecond of audio from him. Mm -hmm. We could figure him out immediately. Was that the case before 1977? I don't think so. I don't either. Yeah. No one knew of him. A little interesting fact about... Uh, Orson Welles? No, no, no. Um, about James Earl Jones. When he was young, and I, and I don't know what age is, mm -hmm. but when he was young, apparently he had to take voice lessons. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they taught him to do was to speak slower and deeper to help him through whatever issue. Now, I never personally spoke with James Earl Jones about this. Oh, I see him every day for lunch. It's this is just something right. I picked up, so <laughs> whether it's fact or fiction or right. urban legend, I can't say, but it, I think it's interesting nonetheless. Absolutely. One thing I've, I've just learned today, one of our listeners uh, sent me a message and said, asked me if I knew that Hugo Weaving is actually going to be in the new Star Wars movie. He's actually oh, really? going to play um, an imperial guy, not just like uh, somebody standing there. No, he's, a character. Uh, you don't cast Hugo Weaving as an extra. <laughs> well, you know, some, sometimes people like to be in movies, but right. they don't have a part for him. So right, they just like they're just to show somewhere. up in there. Right, but I, I think he's going to have a little bit more front and center 
role. Mm -hmm. So I got really excited when I heard that my favorite actor of all time is going to be in one of the best movie franchises mm -hmm. of all time. Now, to be fair, Hugo Weaving didn't play a very great supervillain in um, Captain America. You mean the Red Skull? I loved it. I, awesome. I didn't like his role. And the reason his acting in that movie was nowhere on par with V for Vendetta. It was nowhere on par with Matrix in my mind. Now, you say his acting. Do you mean his acting or do you mean the role? Um, you know, that's a good point. I think I'm going to point to his acting on that one. Um, because he could have done, to me, the Red Skull in that movie didn't seem as sinister as he should have. And I really think that Hugo Weaving could have done a better job with that. I mm -hmm. really do. Um, I wonder how much of that really was him or the director. The, the writing, the directing. Well. You know, I, I, I don't know. But, but all we get to see is his acting. It, so. All we get to see is his acting. And when you have a giant like Hugo Weaving in do anything... I think he could do well. Have you seen V for Vendetta? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, watch that movie. I have a Blu-ray copy. I'll let you borrow it. It's fantastic. You don't see his face ever because he wears the mask. He is V. But his delivery in that was, you could almost see a face. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was that good to me. But Anyway, um, moving on. What are we drinking today? Uh, I have coffee, <laughs> and I've picked up from Starbucks a... Uh, bottle of uh, wild turkey i mean it's uh <laughs> hazelnut syrup but it looks like a bottle of wild turkey uh, it, it does <laughs> and actually i was like all right we're gonna get a good movie in today <laughs> actually it was a christmas gift so yeah i think someone knows me well but. there you go well you know booze is always a good gift in my mind <laughs> yeah. even when it's just syrup right right so anyway How about yourself what are you drinking uh same thing i'm drinking coffee um but no additives no additives i'm, I'm a little run down today and i need something to kind of pick me up and honestly coffee is about the best thing there is so awesome well i think i'm ready to watch empire strikes back absolutely let's do this here we go and we're back all right that was a good movie i, I would ask for first impressions but that's kind of late it, <laughs> it is a little bit late uh, i've seen this movie eight million times and empire strikes back is a little bit interesting to me because i don't feel like a lot of star wars fans like it as well as return of the jedi or even A New Hope, because you, it's slower. Do you get that from people you've personally talked to or from, like, messages? messages um, per right? People I've personally talked to. Um, the people who are more into science fiction uh, or Star Wars get why I like this movie so much, mm -hmm. but they don't agree um, See, because it's a slower movie. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Now, I know earlier you said this was one of your favorite movies of all time. Uh, this is definitely my favorite from the Star Wars franchise. Mm, okay. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I felt that way for a long time about mm -hmm. this movie. Um, e even going back as far as when I first saw all three of right. the original set, mm -hmm. uh, it's been one of my favorites. But um, in interesting that, that uh, you've heard otherwise from different people. It is. And well, and it's, it's, in this movie, you, there's, a, there's a lot of things interesting about this movie. Uh, Empire Strikes Back is the first time we actually see Yoda. Mm -hmm. And of the three movies, he has the most screen time in this movie. Well, you're talking four, five, and six. Right, four, five, and six. Mm -hmm. I really refuse to count episodes one, two, and three. <laughs> well, we, we definitely see more Yoda. Yeah, we definitely see more Yoda. And honestly, episode two, we see some cool Yoda. I will admit mm -hmm. that. But in the first franchise, and it was you know, 15, 20, 25 years, 30 years later that we actually have those prequels come out. So here we are with this 20-year stint of the first three Star Wars movies. And in that 20 years, we associate some very iconic things with these movies. But when you think about it, they didn't come out until Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. We see the Force. Yeah, we saw it in the first one, but not like we do here. Yeah, we got a much better understanding of much what Much better it understanding. Is. We understand the scope and the scale. And the most lovable character in the entire Star Wars franchise has 20 minutes of airtime. Right, not all at once either. Not all at once. It's divided up. among the entire movie. Yoda is there just very, very briefly. But everyone knows, non-sci-fi fans and sci-fi fans alike, know who Yoda is. Now, do you think that that lovability is because Luke Skywalker had such an attachment to Yoda? Or do you think it's something intrinsic to the character or something else? Um, I th something intrinsic to the character. First off, he's just kind of a little fuzzy green guy. He's cute. <laughs> I mean, let's mm -hmm. face it. 
And Mark Hamill did do a fantastic job of conveying that attachment to Yoda, mm -hmm. which definitely helps. So now you have a bond between these two characters that are forever immortalized because of the Star Wars universe. You, you see a struggle on Luke's part through learning the Force. And there's Yoda guiding him through it the entire time. So he's a mentor, he's a teacher, he's a father type figure, he's a friend, mm -hmm. compatriot, you know. He's everything wrapped up in one nice little fuzzy little green ball. And they knew each other all of like three days. Right, on all of three days. Yeah. Which, by the way, little fast for Jedi training. <laughs> Hey, this is Luke Skywalker we're talking that's, about. That's, you know, he's yeah. starting late in life, and he's getting the, the he's getting it there, entire training right. in three days. It's the crash well, course. Well, he's, he's the, the hero of the entire galaxy. We get it, so we got to move on quickly. <laughs> At least they didn't do a montage <laughs> or the song. <laughs> I'm getting why the not, training. You know, why not? Just, they did it in Return of the Jedi <laughs> with the stupid bar scene. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. Another thing I really like about this movie, and it's probably, I think, the most fun aspect of this movie, is while we're not watching Luke and Yoda play with the Force, giggity, <laughs> <laughs> while we're not watching that, we're watching Han, Leia, and Chewie, and the two robots, one robot, sorry, 3PO, in a big car chase. Mm -hmm. They're running from the Empire the entire movie. Yeah, well, at least until they get to Cloud City. At least until they get to Cloud City. But that was like, hey, duck in this alley type maneuver. Let's get out of here. And um, Oh, and another thing we actually see for two minutes, if that, maybe eh, two minutes, Boba Fett, the most feared bounty hunter of all time. We see him for two minutes and then 30 seconds in the next movie. Yeah. But everybody knows who Boba Fett is. That's true. You know, so <laughs> that, there's a lot of things in this movie that started the, the likability for the entire franchise for very small elements. I mean, there's small parts of this whole movie that define what Star Wars is. So, you mentioned Boba Fett. Do you think that the movie could have benefited from more of his character, or do you think it was right on? I think it was right on, because you don't want Boba Fett to be the primary focus. You want Boba Fett in there for one purpose, as the guy to take Han away. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You know, I, I really like the lead-in, which it wasn't very big. You get Darth Vader pointing at him saying, and no, no disintegrations. disintegrations. And that tells you everything you need to know about Boba Fett at that moment, at least. Right. And, and Boba Fett, as you wish. Yeah. And Boba Fett didn't care. He's going to get paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easier to kill him. <laughs> you know. But so let's go to the beginning of the movie. Sure. So we have the lead-in, the uh, Star Destroyer is passing by. We mm -hmm. see... You know, some robots getting sent down <coughs> to various places, whatever you want to call them, satellites. Probe droids. And they obviously end up on Hoth. <laughs> One of them do, anyway. Yes, yes. So, from the beginning of the movie, where are you as a viewer? Or do, I mean... I'm kind of wondering what's going on, because we don't know. We, don't, mm -hmm. we, we haven't gotten to the scene yet explaining. We have hundreds of probe droids all over the world, yeah, et cetera. So, it's kind of weird, but you... But not having any dialogue, you actually pick up what's happening right away. And not only that, the lead credits. Mm -hmm. Well, they, yeah, they catch you up. From they the, catch you up. They get you. They explain it to you. I guess what I mean is, where are you, as S, where are you? In front of my TV watching it? <laughs> <laughs> um, on the edge of my seat, honestly. Um, you know, because by this point, we've seen the previous movie. We, we get caught up through that nice little bit of verbiage from the mm -hmm. scrolling runaway credits. And what's going to happen? Where, what is the Empire doing to catch these people? And you expect the Empire to go in guns blazing with as many Star Destroyers as they can. No, no, they're going to be methodical. They're going to send out the droids to do their bidding for them. I mean, that's totally Darth Vader in my mind. And, yeah, it's exciting. It's actually kind of cool. Even that little bit, that little moment from the thing crashing into the ground. By the way, they're scrolling credits. Mm -hmm. outlines that the rebel forces were being led by Luke. <laughs> no. <laughs> he wasn't their leader? No, he, he wasn't. He might have been the leader of a rogue group, the, the fighter squadron, but he wasn't the leader. The reason why I make an issue of this is uh, of sequels go. As far as sequels go, mm. I think this is one of the best lead-ins oh, yeah. as far as, as, as a franchise in... Just about any franchise you I've ever seen. You don't need to watch A New Hope to watch this. 
you you get a nice little backstory and a little. You don't, but I think you captured it perfectly when you said you're on the edge of your seat. Because I am too. You, you see this movie, and it just begins, and you're already on the edge of your seat, and it isn't even two minutes in. Nothing's happened. And this ominous black droid kind of pops out of the wreckage and starts looking around. Mm -hmm. What's he looking for? Why is he there? What the hell's on this planet? Next scene, his hair is this tom-tom walking across the landscape with Luke on it. And that's one of the reasons why I love this movie so much. From the very beginning, I'm already engaged, mm -hmm. and this movie is go. Go. And we're five minutes in, no dialogue yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then we come up to, we see Luke on the tauntaun. By the way, Mark Hamill had a lot of makeup, that first scene. <laughs> a lot of makeup. They had to cover up his scars, because just before production, he got into a car accident. So the entire Wampa scene was written offhandedly. Just to uh, give a reason for him to be... Not have to have makeup on yeah. his face all day. <laughs> right, right. Which, which, hats off to Lucas for doing that. That was an on-the-fly, let's put this in there, explain what's going on. And now we're left with another character. This iconic Wampa, character. iconic character had 10 seconds of screen time. And everybody knows who the Wampa is, whether they know it by name. Right, whether they know it by visual. The, 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 you know what is the Hoth, uh, ice Hoth, the Hoth Ice Monster. Now, what's your opinion of the Wampa in the original creation of the movie versus the re-envisioning? The, the re-envisioning I, I liked better because we saw it. Mm -hmm. We get to see it. Now, there's something to be said. In Return of the Jedi, he did the exact same thing for the Sarlacc pit. And I don't like what he did for the Sarlacc pit. They gave right. it a beak. Be, yeah, no, and much, a lot more tentacles. The tentacles, and to me that didn't make sense. It was I overkill. It was overkill. But in the Wampa's case, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Because the Wampa was dead on exactly what it should have been, in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, that's another thing. How was Luke held upside down? What was holding him there? What was frozen? Yeah, I'd we, like we to conjectured think when we were watching it that it was saliva from Wampa the Wampa. Wampa spares <laughs> Because you'd, you'd have to, as a wampa, you'd have to have a way of softening that ice and then hardening it again. Mm -hmm. And so it did. I don't know. Yeah, kind of curious, but it you know. Oh, and that's and, it, and it was glassy compared to the ice around it, which was snowy. Right, right. It, yeah, it was clear. Mm -hmm. It was whatever it was spitting was pretty darn clear. But anyway, oh, and then the next thing we see. <laughs> Uh, moving right along from that, we start seeing what uh, we see Han rescue Luke, obviously, which was kind of neat, kind of cool. It was, was part of that whole deal. We need to have Luke uh, um, get the instructions from Obi-Wan mm -hmm. on where to go, um, which I'm kind of curious what Luke had in mind before writing in the Wampa. Kind of wondering what that would have been. Where did Obi-Wan pop out of before Luke being stranded in the middle of an mm -hmm. ice field, um, you know. So we, so we get that, and then <laughs> some of the best interactions between Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford take place in literally the next scene. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of the whole hard to get kind of pl t play between them? It was perfect. I really think that really worked because you have this pirate. A scoundrel. I mean, they mm. say it in the movie. That's what he is in the movie. He's a well, scoundrel. she names him that. She names him that. And here's this princess. And he, again, calls her that because that's exactly what she is. Just clearly, clearly attracted to each other. To everybody around them, no less, too. Even mm. Chewie. I mean, he knew. Right. <clears throat> but yet they're going to do this, this silly little banter. Especially, you know, arranging a kiss with the Wookiee. Right. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I have a horrible cough. You know, I really like how they play that interaction, and by the end of the movie, they recognize that they are in love with each right, other. Right, right. Well, Which, we, well, she does. Mm -hmm. You know, he's obviously frozen in carbonite. Right. By the way, perfect line on Han's part. She tells him, I love you, mm -hmm. and his line is, I know. <laughs> it's a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, th yeah, the movie is just fantastic, the entire beginning to end. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about the, the differences between the original uh, production of it and then the reimagined mm -hmm. production of it. Is there anything that you felt didn't work between those two? See, here's... Now, by, by the way, for our viewing audience, what we viewed was the... Remastered. Uh, remastered. Right, because the, the only DVD copies out there now 
are of the remastered. Right. Um, hold on a second here. Just want to make sure that everything's still good on the phone. Um, I, the funny thing is, I think I saw the un, the original version of Empire Strikes Back twice, three times maybe. Mm-hmm. And then every reference I ever make of Star Wars is from the remastered. See, so I, it's, I couldn't even tell you what's not the original versus... I got gotcha. you. Whereas for me, three quarters of my viewings were prior. Mm -hmm. and right. So actually, that's a good question for you then, because you're a little bit more familiar. What didn't work with that remaster? You know what, and I've brought this up to other people, uh, so I'll, I'll ask you about it. Cloud City in particular, yeah. it's... it's uh, I don't want to say claustrophobic, but in the original production, there aren't as many windows, there's a lot less light, and quite frankly, that's how I envisioned a space station. Mm. You have walls, and they're there, you know, and and in the redone version, it, it's really opened up, and you, I noticed it when I watched it, so it brought it to my attention, you know, I'd, I don't want to notice things. I want them to just be there. Right. You okay. know, and so, so I guess actually a good question because they did a very similar thing with the Mos Eisley, uh, Mos Eisley spaceport mm -hmm. in the first movie is they gave you a longer lead in. You see the speeder coming into the town and they kind of pulled away, backed away from the town. And you saw a bigger version of the town. Did you agree with that or was that the same thing, thing with Cloud City? I thought they made Mos Eisley too busy. Too busy? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a scene where some giant thing walks in front of the camera, which mm -hmm. wasn't in the first production. Right, it was a... Um, and that, to, I mean, I know they're trying to add a, a foreground element, but it was just a waste of camera space, right. you know? Why am right. I looking at the side if of this you, thing? If you're going to add that, at. why didn't you fix Han saying parsec? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or when, shouting first, or... Or, yeah. or when uh, the... Stormtrooper hits his head. Right. You know, fix that. Right, exactly. You know? I actually kind of like the Stormtrooper hitting his head, but that's actually a different movie. But to one. me, it, sh it shows that there was a production mistake. Pr right, right. You know, right. It, it's funny if you notice it, you know, those, those geeks out there that have seen it, it's, it's when the Stormtroopers <coughs> are going uh, into capture basically the two droids. They captured the Kareem and Corvette. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Oh, no, that's right. The Death Star scene. Never mind. Yeah, but in any case, between the two, it's like the beak part. You know, right. some some of it was just too much. Too too weird. Return of the Jedi, that opening, that music number that they put in the beginning of it. They didn't need that. Oh, inside the, the bar. Inside um um, Jabba's palace. Right. They yeah. gave you that music. Oh, and, and Jedi, yeah. That was well way overdone. It was ridiculous. I felt. Um, but really, you didn't have. To me, you didn't have nearly as much that in Empire Strikes Back. No, I agree with you. Um, they added things that stick out to me. They added people walking in hallways. Right. Like the, we talked about uh, Han and, and Leia. In that right. scene, there are some people passing Han I, that they I made don't the, remember. They made the their rebel version. base look more busy, a yeah. little bit busier than, than we originally see. And I actually agree with what they did there. Yeah. So, Oh, by the way, because we're talking about it, because <laughs> the entire movie is of the Millennium Falcon being broken. Yeah. Chewie apparently is a pretty smart Wookiee. <laughs> They don't give him credit. He can't speak <coughs> English, so he comes across as a moron, but he's not. No, exactly. Oh, and that, so that was actually another thing, is Chewie doesn't speak English, and whatever, all his dialogue we get vis-a-vis -vis Han, mm -hmm. because Han understands but That's it. the same thing going on with C-3PO and R2-D2. R2-D2. And actually, every alien race or robot that's beeping and chirping away, you get the one side of the conversation of the person that's able to understand it. I like that. I like, as a viewer, not being able to understand these other things because it seems more real to not understand them. I, I think it also adds an element to the actors that yes. play those particular roles. And Chewie, whether it's Chewie or R2-D2, you know, you, you, they're able to portray emotion based on the physicality. Physicality, right. And what's, you know, what's going on in the scene, you know, what they're doing is more saying to an audience what's happening than the things coming out of my mouth. And, and no one did that better, I don't know the actor's name, no one did that better than the actor for C-3PO. I think You he, mean for R2-D2? No, 3PO. Oh, well he's... Because of what he was getting from R2. Oh, I got you, I got you. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's one thing that I think any great movie does well, is if exposition has to be there to explain your movie too Engage. much, then you lose 
a, you lose out on a quality right. movie. Yep. You, you're, it's a visual medium, so everything or as much as possible should be shown. Absolutely. And you have a Wookiee, you're going to show it. Absolutely. You have R2-D2, you're showing it. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's translated you know, by these ancillary helpers, right. you know, right. in this case Han Solo and C-3PO, you're still, as an audience, you have to interpret what you see. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the way that Lucas, or whoever, because he actually didn't direct the movie, did he? Not, not Empire Strikes Back, no. and not our uh, Je uh, Return of the, the Jedi. Jedi. Right, right. It's whoever the director did perfect on, on how they gave that to us and how they gave us that exposition, but I wasn't bored mm -hmm. through the entire movie with it. You know, you mentioned that you don't like what they did with Cloud City, and I love what they did with Cloud City. To me, it fit more of a city in the clouds rather than a space station. I think I, I saw an interview with George Lucas, and that's kind of his sentiment, is he was in his way of saying, this is what I would have done if I had the budget to do it originally. Right, or the technology or whatever, yeah. right. right. You know, and there, I think this goes to the differences between a book and a movie, mm. you know. I, in my mind, I had certain expectations. This right. is what the inside of a space station looks like, and I was used to it because I was comfortable with the first way it was done. Right. And right. then suddenly it's not meeting now, my expectations. Now they're changing it. It's not, the, it's not hallways anymore. Right. Now it's all these open glassways. And, right. it, you know, so I'm thinking this doesn't look like what I expect it to look like. Right. But, you know what? As far as any viewer goes, that's your right. Absolutely. I mean, if that's how you want to delineate between liking well, a movie and not liking a movie, fair enough. Well, and that's uh, that's actually ultimately what what got Lucas in trouble with the fans with the remake of the next three movies, of the prequel movies in one, mm -hmm. two, and three. He gave them, he gave us, not his vision. But what he thought we wanted. But what we thought we wanted, yeah. right. So, it, it, yeah, it got him in trouble in my mind because... Uh, yeah. You know, but at the same time, I still think this is one of the best movies uh, of all time. And, you know, it is my favorite of the Star, Star Wars, Wars franchise. franchise. One thing, it's, it's another thing. I was talking about iconic figures in these movies. We see the Lord of All in this movie. We see Palpatine for the first time mm -hmm. through a holographic projection. And, man, do you get a sense of dread, evil hatred from this guy and you see him for 30 seconds see this goes to what we're saying about yoda about you know wookie and, mm -hmm. and r2d2 this movie really does a great job of just showing you enough you know we, we said right. it for boba fett it shows you just enough mm -hmm. to let you carry on with the rest of the movie right. without overdoing it and certainly without underdoing it well and then it gave you a nice nice lead into return of the jedi where we see Palpatine takes center stage in directing of all. And it wasn't overdone there either. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't the entire movie. It was him and Vader against the well, other I think people. But. It, the horror genre does this really well. At least some, some movies. Some of them. Late, but, lately, though. Well, like, let's, let's talk about Alien for a second right. here. The jumping over. Mm -hmm. You don't see much of the Alien until Ooh. the end of the movie. Right. And it builds anticipation. Right. And I think that's what this movie... This movie was about building anticipation for Return of the Jedi. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that's that what sense. it does. It's so well because, like we said, from, from the very beginning, you're on the edge of your seat yeah. waiting to see what happens, and it leaves you at the end, in my opinion, on the edge of your seat see, waiting to see what's going to happen. Because you... Well, the, and the reason this is my favorite movie is the bad guy actually wins. While the good guys aren't dead and really defeated, they're still able to come back and kick ass. But the bad guy wins this round. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And because of that, we have unresolved issues that we need to go watch the next movie for. Mm -hmm. And I like how they did that. And that actually brings me into my next point. Star Wars is the first movie franchise that I'm aware of that decided to put out a three-movie story arc. All as a group. As a group. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the pre all three movies were led into each other to continue that story idea, to to finalize that thought. Took three movies to do it. We hadn't, I don't know of any movies previous, and now we see them everywhere. We see them in Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, uh, the Matrix series, I mean, on and on it goes. I, my understanding is that Lucas, when he first scripted Star Wars, mm -hmm. 
which I, I don't believe that was actually the original title. I think it was supposed to be The Star Wars or right, something like that. Right. But in any case, he recognized right away that he couldn't do it all mm. in one movie. Right. Everything he wanted to do, the whole... By the time arc. he got done, it would be a six-hour, eight-hour thing. And he didn't so he that. broke it up into, into pieces, and then that's how we got A New Hope. And, of course, that was su successful commercially, so they were able to then... Use that make money, two and three. right, right. Go in and make the others. But it's the first time we've seen a series like that. You know? Well, my, my point, I guess, is that from the beginning, though, it the idea meant to, was to right. It was, was meant a to whole be, arc. Right. And then, oh, no, we got to break it up. There's a way too much in here to do in just one movie. It, so, you know, yeah. right now, the, uh, the Hobbit is mm -hmm. being made into movies. And if you look at that story, I think it's an excellent example of the same kind of thinking. thinking. You, you have a whole story, but to do it right, to do it well... It really needs to be chunked down. Which actually is different than Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings was three separate stories. Mm -hmm. Book one, book two, and book three. Um, and you just make a movie per each book. Or so that... Yeah. Right. But that makes sense. That makes sense in that regard. Um, oh, man. What else did I need to bring up about this movie? There's a few things. I'm trying to think of problems or inconsistencies that I had with the movie. Be, uh, in the movie itself or between the other movies? Uh, be in this movie specifically, in in, return, in um, Empire Strikes Back. Oh, I remember. Uh, the giant worm on the asteroid mm -hmm. really wasn't buying it. <laughs> I, I wasn't sold. Was it the fact that they were just <coughs> walking around the outside of the, the ship without any kind that of helps. protection on that, that, Except that, a, a gas mask? That, that helps <laughs> because inside this space beast... Uh, the, the, the Millennium Falcon touches down, which, by the way, how did you not notice teeth on the way in? Yeah. Because was it just laying asleep with its mouth wide open? Maybe the, the mouth of the cave is smaller than just the inside. Maybe. So Maybe. it kind of sits inside with the recess, the little area. I don't know. I'm happy. You have to, you have to make excuses. Oh, you do. And, and, and that actually gets us, that actually, you know gets into what we talked about in World War Z. The more assumptions we have to make, the less I'm on board. And we have to make a lot of assumptions with this damn space beast. This is probably the biggest thing that drives me nuts in this entire movie. Because not only do they land, not only are they, you know, are, are they you know, they're able to live inside this thing, but there's other creatures outside of the Millennium Falcon. Minox. Mm -hmm. Han Solo knew who, what they were, which tells me he's seen them before. They aren't space-dwelling creatures. They're just floating around, and it's pressurized in here with this thing wide open. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, Leia says, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I had a bad feeling about but this. But I'll, I'll ask you this. Did you think about that the first time you watched it? No, I did not. That's when, fair. When did you finally come uh, That would probably be on my like 30th watch of the show. <laughs> it, was it because of you watching it, or did someone else say something? Because of me watching it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I... I I, I watch the movie for the 30th time. And, I, and you're starting to pick up... I, oh, I pick out the minutest of things. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how I ended up noticing that in the opening strolling right. scroll bar, they said Luke is the leader. You know, it's it's that. Because I'll agree with you. I the first time I watched... Now, I was a lot young. Mm -hmm. I don't know when you, how old you were, but when I saw uh, Empire Strikes Back, I was young. And I didn't notice that Dug at it. all. It was cool. It was all good, right. yeah. yeah. And it wasn't until later... Yeah, you know that you're like, hey, wait a second, this, this doesn't, uh, doesn't work doesn't here. Jive, right. You know, it's kind of like the the whole thing with uh, when they when the uh, when the Empire attacks Hoth. Mm. You know, whether they're too close or too far. You know, how, why do they have to land outside the shield? And right. It kind of logistically didn't make sense. Didn't make a lot what, of what sense. Are, and for those of you that aren't exactly familiar with the movie, Darth Vader takes issue with his admiral on how close they came out of light speed to Hoth. And the reason is uh, because they're too close. Right, I guess. You know, or, you know some, something they, like apparently that. Apparently they wanted to approach through the asteroid field. I, I'm not sure, yeah. Which it really didn't work for them later when they're trying to chase down the Millennium Falcon. They're losing ships. <laughs> this is the reason why you should be Darth Vader. If you're going to be anybody, be Darth Vader. Because you <coughs> don't have to have reasons. No. We're, we're Just give close. a command, and if the guy, the one guy fails you twice, actually we counted it during the movie, yeah. you, you have to fail Vader twice, and he'll kill you then. Not the first time. <laughs> first time he'll let it slide. You've failed me for too many times, right. number two. Yeah, right, twice, you're dead. You know. oh, oh, by the way, General Veers in this movie turns out to be Walter Donovan in uh, 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 Indiana Jones. And Last Crusade. Last Crusade, yeah. yeah. So we see the actor, which was kind of neat, and then later he... Uh, 
Um, actually, it's, it's in post-production. Lucas was certain. No, it wasn't. Never mind. It was a previous movie. It was the first Star Wars movie. Lucas was certain that it wouldn't fly, that it wouldn't flop in the theaters. So instead of going to the opening premiere, he went on a vacation in Hawaii mm -hmm. with I've heard Spielberg. Yeah. And that's where they came up with the idea for Indiana Jones. So kind of fun, kind of interesting there. So, yeah. But, but we see that actually in tons of other stuff. Lucas and Spielberg, you know, hand in hand doing all sorts of stuff. Indiana Jones, wonderful series. Mm -hmm. So, but, <laughs> yeah. There's, to me, what makes this movie solid the entire way through is the story I think is one of the best stories ever told in this one movie it's, it's so awesome because you have this small group of people just trying to fight their way through the empire to survive well not even just survive they're actually against the empire they're going to go mm -hmm. attack yeah, they, they, they want to just destroy dismantle it whatever right right so you've got these small group of people. The Empire is this massive imposing force. It is, at its core, a good versus evil story. Um, the bad guy wins. The, you see character development untold. You know, I've never heard or seen character development that I really agreed with as I have with Empire Strikes Back. Because the entire time that Luke is on Dagobah with Yoda, it's all character development. That's all that is. And there's a lot of it <laughs> in that, but... Well, let me ask you, uh, what has been claimed to be the biggest reveal in movie history is when we find out that Darth Vader, Vader. is yeah. Luke Skywalker's father. When we watched just now, did it still work for you? Yes. Yes, it did. And I think the reason is, is because of the voice. Because <laughs> of James Earl Jones' voice and the, and the conviction, the... the intensity that he puts behind it when delivering mm -hmm. that one line it's striking even so, now what do you think of luke's reaction oh i hated it <laughs> i really did <coughs> <coughs> because luke gives up and decides to commit suicide now, I, I don't like we, it we talked about this while we we're watching it do you think he was really trying to commit suicide or do you think that he knew that he would go out one i of think he was trying to commit suicide I think he was trying to commit suicide. I don't think he was confident enough in the force to guide himself down one of those tubes. I really don't. But he ends up calling Leia. He I does, mean, but he survived. I think he was as shocked that he survived as the rest of us. Now, supposedly they're on a gas giant mm. or some, some kind of gas planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Bespin. Would he really have fell into his death? Ye he could have fallen out of atmosphere that was breathable, perhaps, but... I mean, there would be time he could call Leia or something. Right, else. he would be floating down, he'd be falling for quite a while, but it wouldn't be very long until he reached a point where the pressure would kill him. Um, air or no, I mean, it wouldn't take very long at all because he would be accelerating as he went, that's, you know, gravity. But so would you change that? Um, the, the, the whole jumping off? No, thing? no. I like that Luke, I like it that, I don't like it that Luke jumped. Mm -hmm. In the first place, I think I would have liked to have seen Luke mad. Mm -hmm. I I would like to have seen that a little bit of rage that we are told is bad because of the dark side reasons. I think that would have been a kind of a little bit better of a character builder. So what if say something like he uh, lunges at Vader and Vader redirects his saber and Luke's saber cuts the well. The, but see, Luke lost his saber though. Oh, man. he did. But he could have used the force to get it back like right. he did with the... Uh... Right, or, or something. I think something that... I think it would have made more sense for Luke to give a surprise attack against Vader. Vader is the one that falls. But Vader is good enough in the force to guide himself to a hole or porthole to get himself out of that. And then they both go their separate ways. Luke runs, you know, and gets out of there. I think that would have been better. I mm -hmm. really, really do. However, that's not what we get. So we see Luke fall, jump. You know, for just sheer drama... Him jumping is very dramatic. It is. I don't... Especially when you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, you, that's you, true. You, you, Where's falling. he going to fall in? Yeah. Where's he going to end up? And, and after he realizes that he's not dead, and he's just... I like the idea of him hanging on for dear life. Uh, and that little antenna On thing, the little antenna. Which doesn't make sense why they would have that right underneath right the trash Right under a port. trash port. I know. Seems like there would be a guy down there every day. <laughs> cleaning, <laughs> cleaning the, the antennas. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> I like it that Luke is there hanging on for dear life and throwing out one last Hail Mary. 
you know. Which, by the way, how is that not a clue that he was related to her? It seems like that if he could do that, he would have some... Well, it couldn't. I mean, this is the only one we see him communicating that's, you know, with. That's a good point. But He also talks to a dead guy in Obi-Wan, so... No, they're not related as far as we know. Right, exactly. Exactly. Although that would be a funny little fan <laughs> fiction. <laughs> it's actually not <laughs> Darth Vader is the father. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Swapped it, Bert. Now Vader really is best. Now Vader has a good cause to be mad. <laughs> yeah, but what would this, that say about Vader's ability to, to... Although he had no idea Leia was his daughter. No, he didn't. He didn't. And you got to like Vader's class, little style in this movie. Technically, uh, he didn't even know Luke was his son. No. Well... No, because he, he questions the Emperor when the Emperor says... That that's the case. It's the son of Skywalker. He says, How is that possible? It's the son of or Skywalker, like that, right? when the Emperor tells him. Yeah. And I love that they purposely avoid associating Vader with Skywalker right. during that moment. And to me, later now, after I've seen it eight million times, as I'm older and I analyze it a little bit deeper, even on the first run through of the different movies, that would have been a clue for me. Right, why didn't he say, well, it's your son? Right, exactly. Why are you beating around this bush? Yeah, why does the emperor care? And they don't, well, they don't. They don't beat around the bush for each other, for the care actors. They beat around the bush for the audience. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I, eh, but you got to like Vader's style in this movie. W which, ironically, we find out just 20 minutes later right. what the truth is. Right, exactly, exactly. I like Vader in this movie because he... The one line that he gives actually outlines it perfectly. Asteroids don't concern me. Get, I want that ship. Right. And I'll be damned, he's flying his entire fleet, the Super Star Destroyer, which is kilometers long, going through the asteroid field, losing ships as they go. He doesn't care. Mm. But the minute his boss gets him on the phone, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> we yep. got to go call him my boss. Yeah, that really shows you their dynamic. Absolutely. That that no one can tell Vader what to do or not to do, except for one person. Mm -hmm. And he was scared of that one person, which is why he immediately turned around the ship and called him back. But it also explains his desire to ally himself with Luke. Mm -hmm. Together they could defeat... They could bring down the which Emperor. Which was great foreshadowing oh. for Return of the Jedi. Which, by the way, one thing I have to ask, because Vader, he's a liar, he's a cheat. He'll, you know, he cheats and lies to get what he meant. He changes the deal on Lando, the entire movie. Mm -hmm. Poor Lando. I really kind of felt bad for him for a little bit, but he should have been a little bit more of an upright guy. Anyway, <laughs> but... Why did he trust Vader in the first place, though? Right, exactly. Why would you do that? I don't understand why you thought that would be a good deal, because you know... You would have to know. He's not just going to let you keep the leader of the rebel, rebel Republic. Come on. <laughs> Come on. What were you going to say? Uh, anyway, um, I don't remember, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's so much fun. I could talk about this movie for hours. I really could. Well, let, let's, uh, let's end with uh, a final comment. Absolutely. Any final comments? Um, just watch it. <laughs> yeah, if you've never seen Empire Strikes oh. Back, highly recommended. So what's your rating? Uh, my rating, is now, now I'm earlier in, the, in our little broadcast here, I said that just because it's my favorite movie, doesn't necessarily make it the best movie. Their production value isn't on par with other movies that we see even today because, oh, that's a sign of the times. I'm going to mm -hmm. give it that. Um, but do you think it rated for then? It, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, even though it wasn't what Lucas... Even though it wasn't what Lucas' vision was and, and the production... What that tells me is the production isn't, wasn't as good as it could have been even then. Mm -hmm. So kind of take a little bit of an issue. The storyline in it is fantastic. It is slow. There, half of the movie is just Luke playing around with the Force, which is kind of... You, you know, going to throw another giggity in there? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and there, it's not that exciting. And the only reason it's exciting to me is because I love... The, the, the Force is the center point of the entire Star Wars franchise. Um, you, you know, I, I know we're looking at final comments here. One thing I liked about... Empire Strikes Back is they didn't overdo the Force. Yeah. I think as movies progressed, especially with the one, episode one, episode two, episode three, the Force is just thrown around yeah. literally at whim. And, and it almost undervalues it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this movie, there seems to be some 
struggle, you know, that, that Luke has to overcome something. He, even when Yoda is lifting up the X-Wing, mm -hmm. he's not just, like, tossing it around like, no. a, like it's a, Spinning you know, it around and, like, a top. He had to concentrate and he, make it work, you know? And what I like about that scene is the Force was this thing that we really didn't quite understand. We can move stuff around. But here's this creature, a foot and a half tall, two feet tall, mm -hmm. able to, with his mind, lift out a starfighter. <laughs> How cool is that? You know, I mean, that's, oh, that's, the music around that one moment, and the, oh, and the, the creepiest, it, the creepiest line ever given in that movie came from the best character of that movie, came from Yoda. He says, Luke told Yoda, I'm not afraid. Oh, yeah, I love that oh. line. The, the line that follows. You will be. Yeah. You will yeah, be. Yeah, it, re it reminds me, I think a year or so ago, I, I went to Disneyland, and I brought back to you as a gift a pin. Yes. It was Yoda, and uh, he was standing underneath one of those Disneyland height measurements. Right, didn't measure it, didn't measure up. And it says, judge me by my size, <laughs> do you? <laughs> it was so great. Which so is right out of Empire Oh, Trek absolutely. Back. But anyway, getting back to the final comments. Um, this movie, as far as a rating system, is my favorite movie. Um, but a favorite movie doesn't have to be the best movie ever made. And for that reason... It's Star Wars gets a one six pack rating. Mm -hmm. you know, get some beer, and this movie is going to be absolutely fantastic. I'm not going to give it a two or three six pack because it was damn good. Mm -hmm. But I think a one six pack rating is just sufficient for this movie. You know, I think there are some movies that I just like to watch cold, and this is one of them that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be a little bit nostalgic for me. Obviously, I, wasn't I think that's why I like it so much. Now. Drinking as a kid, so. You know, but it brings back some of those those fond memories of, of movies that I enjoyed when I was younger. Mm -hmm. So watching watching it as is 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 fine with me. Yeah. So nice. I'm gonna give it a zero, zero six pack six rating. Pack. Wow. But that's not necessarily bad. No, it's so. not. It's not. Because I am happy to watch the movie without beer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, other people out there I can see would disagree with us. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying go get a six pack of beer and then watch it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you feel inspired while you're watching it, open that, that first that, one. That's yeah. right. There you go. Get cracking. Get cracking. Well, with that, uh, I want to thank our viewers for watching SNM on Sci-Fi. This is M. This is S. Have a great day. Thanks for watching.